So I just have um, some, everybody can hear me? I, I have some uh, brief remarks. I want to thank the awards committee and the Canadian Association of Teacher Education for their wonderful recognition of my research contributions. And I know that a lot of people gave time to this nomination and I thank everybody for th that. Um, it's a challenge to believe that the first edition of Practice Makes Practice, a critical study of learning to teach, was published 25 years ago. And indeed, if I take into account when this research began, I'm back to my doctoral education 35 years ago at the University of Massachusetts. And if I go back even further, it would be when I was a teenage student teacher. I can go back further. Uh, <laughs> We have to go back. <laughs> uh, but I will content myself with quoting from the beginning of Charles Dickinson's novel, David Copperfield, quote, I record that I was born as I had been informed and then began to cry, unquote. <laughs> so, while I have aged, uh, when it comes to my first book, Practice Makes Practice, uh, the Dickinsonian characters of learning, however, those that are drenched drenched in experience and who hold great expectations, they have not aged. Their literary appeal may have a great deal to do with one of the common questions I am often asked, but what happened to Jack and Jamie? Um, where are they now? Do you still see them? And then the worst one, but why didn't you help them? <laughs> with irony, I can say that where they are, their address belongs to readers, their readers will encounter the play of the unconscious and the making of teachers only to decide whether our great expectations must, st must stall over the anxiety of losing possibilities. So I can now say that teacher education is an emotional situation as much as it is in a, as an affective measure of what any society can tolerate knowing. The great uh, dilemma is twofold, or at least that's how I've understood matters of practice. On the one side, teacher education, as with any education, inherits its unresolved history along with a new life that it doesn't know. The teacher is a stranger to herself and to others. On the other side, our field is estranged, affected by our human condition that includes the social's wide-ranging emotional attitudes towards its own leftover impressions from the history of education. And because we are so affected by life, Ours is a contentious, evolving, and complex field. And in thinking the very thought of education, the borders of teacher education needs to be thought of as amazingly porous, or perhaps can even be seen as borderline, as between the education of education and our anxieties and hopes for newness. And for me, the haunting leftover questions are these. What happened to teacher education? And when are we not talking about teacher education? even as we take on problems that seem very far away and unrelated. These questions part me, led me to learn from and think with the practices and theories of a related field, namely the contentions and curiosity of psychoanalysis. Uh, with the Freudian ideas that we learn before we understand, that we feel before we know, and that we are affected by histories we have not lived, I continue to present the enterprise of education as subject to the human condition of uncertainty or what psychoanalysts talk about as anxiety over loss of love. I consider one of my key contributions is introducing a new vocabulary and new questions to our study of the education of educators. And for much of my work, I have reached into the psychoanalytic archive of experiments in education, development, pedagogy, and learning. The notion of development becomes uneven and incomplete. With this, with this idea, I made some comparative studies of learning the impossible professions to reconsider debates, <clears throat> debates on conflicts in education um, and literary authors in cinema and the study of social <coughs> narratives, the study of psychoanalytic figures, <coughs> most recently in a little book on Melanie Klein and another book that's a little bigger called The Psychoanalyst in the Classroom. So I want to conclude just by going behind the scenes of my research and talk just a little bit about my research scaffolds. These are things that happen behind our desk, that were behind the couch, so to say. So here are some sort of the rules of thought that I have as I work. Go right to the heart of the matter, or do so, but this time with feeling. Take uh, this, uh, a study to take it for granted thought, uh, through to the events of inexperience, hesitations, mistakes, 
accidents and desires, or study our educational neuroses, use comedy and tragedy as narrative devices to study the fantasies of the childhood of teacher education, freely associate with conflicts, complaints, and magical thinking, follow the wish and the sequence of fantasies, present the unspoken question or anxiety or create the enigmatic metaphor, consider symptomatic acts as meaningful, frame the stories with literary devices and narrative flair, make the familiar strange and the strange familiar, treat objects as close as <coughs> they appear, accept the fate that the author is not outside of the problem, think allegorically, take seriously discarded and forgotten content and link and link nonsense to new dilemmas, respect the unconscious even if we can't know it, <coughs> say why, and don't be afraid of problems and obstacles to research. Indeed, these are the compositions of our reflecting subjects, <coughs> even if such conditions give us new writing problems. So again, I thank Kate for this uh, recognition uh, for me, but also I believe to the growing field of psychoanalysis and education, and for this I am grateful. Thank you.